Amen. Judges chapter 17. So, we're entering the part of Judges where we're getting into, um, you know, the, the really messed up stories in the Bible. <laughs> if I was going to preach a sermon series on messed up stories in the Bible, I'd spend most of my time at the last latter part of, of Judges. Okay, and this is where it kind of we're done with Samson, we're done with Gideon, a lot of the, the stories of the Judges in the Bible, and we're getting to these stories in Judges, where you just like, you're reading these stories, and it's funny because this particular story here, I can, when I read this story, I still remember how I felt the very first time I read this story. And I don't know if you, you have that, that feeling where you've read something several times, but I can still remember reading this story for the first time, and like almost every single verse in Judges chapter 17, you read it, and you're just like, what in the world? <laughs> What's going on here? So let's go ahead and look at Judges chapter 17 and get into um, this story. And as we, um, as we go through these stories in the last part of the book of Judges, we are going to um, look at the parallels in these stories to what's happening um, with us today in our lives today, okay? And, you know, you may be shocked at how many parallels there actually are. You know, so when you read something like this, you know, you're typically like, well, you know, what's going on here? But um, you may be shocked at how uh, it's not really that new, even compared to what you're dealing with today in the world around you. Look at Judges chapter 17. It's a, it's a short chapter, but there's a lot here. Okay, look at Judges 17, verse 1. The Bible says, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. Oh, that sounds nice. This is a nice story. Let's see what Micah's up to. Okay, verse 2. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, and I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. <laughs> what in the world's going on here? What? I mean, I'm done with this chapter. Just close the Bible. This makes no sense. You know, what? So basically, this woman just says, okay, let me go back. We won't be done. We'll finish. But I mean, <laughs> she's like, hey, mom. You know, let me translate this into modern day English, okay? Hey, mom, remember that, that you know, thousand dollars that you lost? And you just swore up and down, and you were cursing everybody and everybody, and, and you couldn't find it, and you were like, somebody stole it from me. Hey, Mom, it was me. I stole it. And she's like, blessed be the Lord. <laughs> so that, that's what's happening here, okay? That's what, that's what we just read, okay? He's like, I took it. And his mother said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. I mean, he thought Samson was spoiled. You know? I mean, so look, it, first of all, it gives you a kind of, of an idea of, of the kind of guy that we're dealing with right here, all right, right off the bat. We get kind of an idea of the character of Micah, and probably that Micah probably didn't have the best start in life. He probably wasn't, he just, the boy wasn't raised right, is basically what you can say, okay? Look at verse number three. Well, so let's see if it makes more sense. Maybe I just took one verse out of context. Verse number three. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, well, at least he gave it back. At least he gave it back to his mother, so there's hope for Micah, okay? His mother said, I had whole, wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. You're like, what in the world? Look at verse 4. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, meaning, you know, the person that runs the foundry that makes stuff out of metal, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. So first of all, the mom says, I've dedicated this money to the Lord. I, I dedicated it to the Lord for you to make a molten image for you. And you're like, what? What's going on here? So she wants to make a molten image to dedicate the money to the Lord. It's kind of like saying, hey, let's, let's take a special uh, offering in the church. Like we, you know, let's do a special offering next week and we'll take a bunch of money and the money that we raise will go and we'll buy a, you know, a satanic statue to worship. You know, that's basically what she said, right? So they're, she's, she's got, she's got, they're all mixed up here, okay? They're all backwards and mixed up. 
And then he gives her the money back, and that's exactly what she does with it. She goes and she makes a molten image. She literally makes her son an idol. She doesn't make an idol of him. I think she probably has already done that from reading these first few verses. But she makes him a literal idol. Look at verse number 5. And the man Micah had an house of gods. So he already had several idols. This man, he was a collector of gods. He already had a temple or whatever you want to call it of false gods, of gods, of idols or whatever. And he made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. So, I mean, makes perfect sense, right? I mean, you're like, he's got this big temple. He's got all these false idols in it. He's like, we've got to get me a priest. You're going to get me a priest to run this place. So he's like, uh, Jacob, you're going to be my priest. You know, and he consecrates his own son as his priest. Look at verse number six. In those days, there, and now, now, we may, now we see. In verse number six, we, we get to see what's happening here. It kind of wraps it up. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You think? It's exactly what's going on here. Micah's doing what's right in his own eyes. His mom has raised him in the way that is right in her own eyes. She is doing what's right in her own eyes. He's doing what, you know, hey, he saw some money. He took it. She saw some money. She got it back, and she went, and she bought an, she had an idol made, you know, a false god made. And it's because every man did that which was right in their own eyes. There was no, you know, there was no law that anyone was following. So we get some clarity on at least why things are so backwards and so mixed up in the first few verses here. Everyone was just doing what they felt was right in their life. You know, what they felt was spiritual. You know, they, you know, Micah had a house of gods. He felt like that would make him spiritual. He needed a priest, so he just went and he made his son a priest. You know, he just made anybody a priest. Here's my son. Sounds good. He's right there. He can be the priest. Look at verse number 7. And then it gets even better for Micah. Because, I mean, he had his son as a priest. But now, I mean, we have a chance to get even more godly here. Look at verse number 7. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. Whoa! This guy's a Levite. And he sojourned there. He, he stayed there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, where, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. He's like, I'm just traveling around looking for a place. I have nowhere. He's not really going anywhere. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me. He said, And unto me, be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now I know that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. So Micah sees this guy that's a Levite, and he's like, Hey, I mean, look, he obviously doesn't know a lot about the Bible. But he knows enough to know that the Levites are supposed to be the priests in the house of God. He doesn't know, obviously, that you're not supposed to worship false gods. You're not supposed to have idols in the first place. Or he doesn't seem to care. But he's like, hey, I'm going to get me a Levite. Now i got a real priest, even though he's got false gods and still all these things. So basically, you know, I don't even know where to begin. You know, when you read this chapter, and you're like, you preach a sermon on this chapter, you're like, where do we even begin here? This is so messed up. But look. First of all, I want to point out the parallels. When we talk about Judges 17, Judges 18, Judges 19, and the end of the book of Judges, there's a lot of parallels to what we're dealing with today. Okay? And you know, don't just sit there and think that, hey, that's messed up. Because I'm going to show you tonight how what's happening in Judges 17 is happening today. The exact same thing is happening in our country today. And you say, explain that. We'll turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Let me give you a few points just to show you how Judges 17 is applicable to exactly what we're seeing in our world, even in our country, even in our city today. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. First of all, just this disrespecting of parents. Okay, This, this, this idea that we're going to be disrespectful 
to our parents is, is, is extremely common today. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. And we can't look, we can't even read all the chapters or all the verses in the Bible for sake of time that talk about being respectful to your parents. But Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 1 is 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. What's the promise? That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So this is saying, look, if you're disrespectful to your parents, if you just dishonor your parents, you're just nasty to your parents, the Bible says that will affect you how long you live on this earth. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a promise. So, I mean, here you have an adult son literally stealing from his mother. He's stealing from his mother. I mean, that's the opposite of obeying and being respectful to your parents. Now, the parallels to this today, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, is we actually see um, an entire generation today, I would say, being raised with absolutely no respect for their parents. An entire generation. I mean, if you don't recognize that pattern, you know, if, as you're out in the world, as you're soul winning, as you're doing everything else, you know, you're not paying attention. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's why when we teach about, you know, uh, discipline from the Bible and all these different things, you know, people that first come into this church from outside into a Bible preaching church and they hear sermons on how you're supposed to raise your kids and, and how you're supposed to discipline your kids and how you're supposed to chastise your children if you love them, you know, that may be hard to hear for people coming from the outside world to hear or coming from some, you know, liberal church that says nothing to hear. That may be a difficult message to swallow because it's not what's being taught anywhere today. Okay, which is why we're seeing what we're seeing today. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's also a sign, by the way, of the end times. It's also a sign of the end times. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and it goes on and on. But look, this is, remember the clues and the milestones? This is a clue, okay? Because look, it was happening in Judges chapter 17. That obviously wasn't the end of the world, okay? That obviously wasn't the end times. It's happening today. Could it be the end times? We don't know, but it could just be, look, it's a sign of a, of a declining civilization for sure, for sure. I mean, this civilization in the end of the book of Judges here that we're seeing in Judges, it was reaching a breaking point. It was reaching a breaking point where civilization had broken down, where morality had broken down to the point where God had to just, he had to reset things. He had to reset things. He had to, he had to give them a king. He had to put in, you know, a new um, leadership structure because things were just completely out of control. Things were just completely out of control. So look, we see that there's parallels to even just the first couple verses here where Micah is just completely disrespectful to his mom and she, she's okay with it. She's okay with it. He stole from her. She's like, oh, blessed be my son. You know, oh, you know, she wishes a blessing on him after he admits that he stole from her after she was even upset that she had this money stolen from her. But the main point that I want to make this evening is this. So that's just a kind of a side note, this disobedience to parents. Look back at verse number 7. The main point I want to make and the main parallel that I want to make with Judges chapter 17 with our society today is this. And that is this. It is, it is doing things our own way. So if there was a title to this sermon, it would be our own way. Our own way. That is the story. That is the real, the heart of the lesson of Judges chapter 17 is our own way. Look at verse number 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man. So it says there was no king in Israel. Meaning, look, there was just no leader. There was no leader in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know, the Bible teaches this philosophy that as a society gets more and more and more immoral, that you will need more and more and more worldly leaders over you. You know, the founders of this country knew the same thing. They knew that as, you know, we're not a religious people anymore, and as our morality declines, is like your freedom is just going to be inversely proportional to that. As your morality goes down, you know, you're, well, it's directly proportional. As your morality goes down, your freedom's going to go down. Because you have to be controlled by something. That's just the way it works. So look, 
our own way is, is what was going on in Judges 17. And look, I'm telling you, it's what's going on today. It's what's going on today. Micah was a man going his own way. Micah was a man doing things the way he thought they should be done, just out of his own, just how he wanted. He wanted a house of gods, he made a house of gods. He wanted a priest, he made his son a priest. He, he made an ephod for him to make him look like a priest. He gave him all the stuff that a priest would have. He made him a priest. And then a Levite came along. He's like, ooh, now i got a real priest. He's a Levite. So Micah was a man that was just, he was just making it up as he went. And he was doing things how he wanted. Now look, the first thing I want to point out about our own way is how we worship God actually matters. Did you know that? Turn to Exodus chapter 20. Knowing the law matters. Clearly people were not reading the Bible in Micah's time and place. Turn to Exodus chapter 20, just for a simple example. Look, it's, part of, it's, it's, the, it's one of the Ten Commandments. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of commandments in the Bible. This is one of the main ten. Okay, Look at Exodus chapter 20, and look at verse number 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So look, God, God here is saying, don't make a graven image. Why? Because you're going to worship it. <laughs> He's like, don't make graven images because, you, you know, men are stupid enough. I mean, look, men are stupid enough that if they make these graven images and they make these little temples, they're going to worship it. I mean, how many Buddha temples have you ever seen? How many little Buddha statues do people in this city probably have in their house? You know, how many statues of other religious whatevers do people put in their house that, that they think that gives their house power? Or they think that that gives their house some kind of you know, religious protection or whatever. Look, God says don't do that. He says I'm a jealous God. He's like, I'm the God. Not these idols, these dumb idols of, of stone and wood and, and iron or whatever else. He's like, I'm a jealous God. The parallels, I mean, the parallels today. So, I mean, Micah, he was just worshiping God in a completely, he wasn't even worshiping God. He was worshiping different gods, but he was worshiping, he was getting his spiritual fix in a completely unacceptable way. Completely unacceptable. But look, as stupid as this whole story sounds, look at what's happening today. Look at what's going on today. Look at the churches today that are popular, even in our own city. You know, look at uh, you know, these mega churches. How are they worshiping the Lord? You wonder, you wonder even what Lord they're worshiping. As you know, they, they have these, you know, the rock concerts and the, and the music that, you know, it sounds no different than the music somebody is driving down the street in Fresno blaring in their car. It sounds the exact same as that in a church. I mean, look, these people, I mean, their music mimics the world. You know, we'll turn to Romans chapter 12. You say, what's the big deal? As long as we make Christian lyrics and we talk about Jesus, what does it matter what the tune of the music is? Well, it does matter because the Bible says it matters. That's why. Look at Romans chapter 12. You say, I mean, man, you're getting really specific, but the Bible tells us that we should not be doing this. What do you mean? We should not be looking, we should not be trying to turn this church into what the world looks like. Because the Bible, why? Because me? No, because the Bible says this in Romans 12 too. It says, and be not conformed to this world. Is that hard to understand? It says, hey, don't try to go out and look like the world looks like. But you know what? You know what? You know what's funny? You know, there's a reason they do it. They don't do it just because, you know, they like the tune. They do it because that's what people want. They do it because people, look, it's almost like God, when he wrote Romans 12, 2, it's almost like he knew what would happen. He did know what would happen. He said, be not conformed to this world, but, what's the opposite of that? But, be transformed. Be transformed. That means, that means, you know what that means? You know when you transform something, you know what you do? You know when you transform, when you take, when you have a transformer for electricity, you know what you're doing? You're changing it in some way. You're taking something in 
and you're sending it out and it's different. You're making it different for a different use. And look, it says, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. It's saying your, your mind should be transformed. It should be changed. That you may prove that what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Look, it is, it is God's will. It is God's perfect will that when you go to church and you study His Word and you listen to what the Bible has to say for you. Look, the Bible has a lot to say for you. Does it not? I mean, how in the world can I get up here? I'm not that interesting. How can I get up here and preach so much? How can I get up here and preach so many messages that aren't exactly the same? It's because the Bible has so much to say for your life. It has so much to say on what this transformation is about. And, and look, you're to be, and that, that transformation is the perfect will of God, is what Romans 12, 2 is saying. It is God's perfect will. It's not just, it's not just his, his thoughts, his idea that he had one day. It's his perfect will that you be transformed. And that you be transformed according to this. There's a lot here. Well, you're going to come here for a year, and you're not going to hear everything that's here. You're going to come here for two years, three years, four years. You're not going to hear everything that's in here. There's that, that's how much transforming needs to be done. That's the perfect will of God that you would be transformed. Not that you would go somewhere so you could just be the same. But you know what? It's easier. It's easier to go somewhere where you can just be the same. We don't have to transform anything. You just go there, be the same. And they're going to tell you, bless you, they're going to tell you, hey, everything's fine. Be the same. No, but if I get up here and I read what the Bible says and I say, look, no, this one thing right here, that's got to change. This thing over here, it's got to change. If you don't change this, it's going to be a disaster. If you don't change here, you're going to wreck everything. Look, that's not that great to hear sometimes. Because change is hard. It's difficult. So you go... You know, you go to a church that's just like just pure, solid entertainment. People, they just want to be entertained. You know, there, there's a, they just want to like go to, you know, they just want to go. <laughs> well, let's turn, let's turn the pulpit into a clown show. Hey kids, how about that? How about I get up here in a clown outfit, big red shoes, and we just have a clown show every day. Yep. You come to church and we have a clown show. It's funny for five minutes until everybody ruins everyone's lives. And nobody gets transformed, nobody changes anything. And, but look, people want to be entertained. That's why people go to movies. They don't care, it's just a bunch of sin and garbage and all this stuff. They just want entertainment. That's it. Now look, I don't want to be boring. I mean, the Bible's not really boring. Well, like you're going to hear stuff that you don't necessarily want to hear. And it's not just pure, cheap entertainment. But people don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. That's why they go to these other places. And that, look, they want to have that spiritual feeling, right? They don't want to go to a rock concert. You know, they want to go to the rock concert on Saturday night, and then they want to go to the rock concert on Sunday morning to, you know, get that spiritual fix. I went to church. That was Micah. I, I went to church and worshipped a bunch of false gods. I went to church, you know, with a real priest. He's a Levite. You know, I had a real live priest. Look at him. He looks like a priest. See all that gold and stuff I put on him? So, look, he wanted to get that spiritual feeling, but he wasn't doing it the right way. Look, that's why these churches have hundreds and thousands of people. It's very easy to understand. Because they're conforming to the world and they have a bunch of people. Because look, I mean, I'm telling you. I mean, if I know anything after a year and a half of doing this, it's hard to get people to conform. I mean, you sit here and you preach and you preach and you preach. It's difficult because people don't want to conform. And I want you to conform because I don't want you to, you know, ruin things for yourself and your family. But people don't want to do it. People don't want to do it. The message. The message. So you got the entertainment, you got the light shows, you got the music. It's all conformed to the world. So what's the message at that point? So you got this church full of worldly people. You got this church full of, I'm not even talking about salvation or not. You got a church full of worldly people. You know, most, I mean, most of the gospels are not correct. 
okay? But I don't even have to go there. Let me just give you an example. You've got a church full of worldly people that the, they don't want to conform to anything. They want to sing the rock music. They, don't want, they want the light shows. They want it to look like the nightclub. They, you know, what, what's the message? they got the nice building, you know, the big uh, arena or whatever it is. Look, the message is this. The message, and it has to be this. It's nothing. It can be nothing. It can be nothing. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because once you have a bunch of people that you're not preaching that they need to be conformed, and you've filled your church that way, you can say nothing in the Bible. Why? Why? Because here's why. Because the Bible says this. It says, 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross, cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. They would hear the preaching of the word of God. And we saw again, turn to John chapter 8. Turn to John chapter 8. We saw again, look, the word of God offends. Remember, it cuts to the heart. It cuts to the heart. So you're going to have this church full of people that you're just trying to you know, get them to just be the same as the world and you're trying to make the, your church like the world and you're trying to make everything look no different than the world and then you're going to preach the Bible? Well, that's not going to work at all. That's not going to work at all. Look, at, look, this has been the tactic of Satan from the beginning. The Word of God offends people. The Word of God offends people. Look at John 8, 44. The Bible says this, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar, and the father of it. Look, he's been trying to get people to doubt God's word from the very beginning. And all those people that are conformed to the, wor to the world, that are sitting in those churches, they all doubt God's word. They would hear God's word and they would, it would just sting their ears and they would be like, ah! What's that all about? Turn to John chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, I'll just read for you. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. That's the first tactic that he uses and it's the main tactic that he uses today. It's like, hey, did God really say that? He said to Eve, are you sure? Did he really mean it that way? He's just trying to plant seeds of doubt. He's trying to take away the absolutism of the Word of God, is what he's trying to do. And that's what's happened today, which is why people can sit in these churches, and why you can't preach the Word of God to those people. You can't do it. It won't work. It's like oil and water. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest what? His deeds should be reproved. You can't have a bunch of people conform to the world and start preaching the Word of God to them. It, something's got to give. Something's going to give. They're either, they're either going to give, or they're going to... They're, they're, they're going to leave, is what's going to happen. So you have a church, if I had, you know, if we started Verity Baptist Church, Fresno, and we just like, we're just rocking this thing out up here. We're rocking, you know, we just left the old hymns, and we left all the, you know, the principled stands on the Bible, and we just had this smoke show up here and all this stuff. Look, I, I couldn't preach the Bible. If I built the church that way, I couldn't preach the Bible, or I'd be preaching to a bunch of empty chairs. Because all those people would leave, if that's what they came for. Look, Bible preaching cuts to the heart. And a man that is in the world is not going to like it. it it's, it's very simple. You know what a cool experiment would be? Would be to take some, you know, like take Joel Osteen's church. I don't even know what it's called. Take this big mega church and just put some fire-breathing Baptist preacher in there. And just do like a, just do an experiment for like, I don't know, it'd probably only take about a week. And you'd have a church about like this. People, I mean, you know, a handful of people probably get saved. You know, people would probably get saved. That's the first thing. But the vast majority of people, they'd hit the door. And they'd hit it fast. As soon as that first time that, that Bible started getting preached, people would be, their ears would just, ah! And they'd be out the door. But it would be cool to watch the filter of God's Word work in an experiment like that. But look, people in the world, folks, 
They don't want to hear, you know, the world preached against. It's like you're preaching against, you know, they're, they, you know you're basically you're going you're gonna to expose their sins. That's what the Bible says. It's not comfortable, but this is religion today. This is religion your own way. This is religion when you do it your way and, and not God's way. But we'll still call it church. We'll still, you know, we'll still have a pulpit. We'll still put a cross on the building. We'll give the priest an ephod. Maybe we'll even get a Levite. You know, how many times have you been to the door and you ask somebody if they're going to heaven and they're like, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Well, how do you know that? Well, my dad's a pastor. My, my mom's a deacon. My mom's a deacon, so I'm going to heaven. Or, you know, my wife is a pastor of the church. I'm good. Thank you, son, for stopping by. You know, I mean, look, it's the same thing as, hey, we got a Levite here. Let's make him a priest. It's the same thing. You know, it, it, calling it church, calling it worship doesn't make it so. Doesn't make it so. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Especially when they're preaching the wrong message. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 3. The Bible says this. Tell me there's not parallels here. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I think Micah needed some sound doctrine, is what Micah needed. Micah's priest needed some sound doctrine. I mean, think about this Levite. I mean, was this guy a Levite coming right out of the temple? I mean, this guy was, this guy, I mean, the temple wasn't even around, but I mean, my point is that this guy, he was, you know, a Levite. This guy came in and he decided, he's like, I'll take the job of a priest of all these false gods. I mean, some spiritual guy this was. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers. There's Micah right here. He's just bringing himself in a priest. He's like, he probably told the guy what to say. He was like, here's how you run this place, and here's what I want you to say. Having itching ears, that they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They have itching ears. They want to hear the things that they, that they want to hear. They want to do it their way. So they're going to get themselves priests. I mean, that's what people are doing today. They went out, they went out, uh, you know, the Joel Osteens and all these people, they got themselves some priests to tell them some fables. That's what they're doing. You ever listen to the messages of these people? That's what they're doing. They're telling fables. They're telling fables. They're telling, they, they'll tell some story. There's nothing to do with the Bible. Tell, you know, it's usually an entertaining story. Maybe even it has lessons. You know, Jack and the Beanstalk had a lesson, a couple of lessons in it. No, seriously, Jack and the Beanstalk, you remember this? I mean, lessons like don't be greedy, listen to your parents, that's great. Let's tell Jack and the Beanstalk next Sunday morning. That's the sermon, Jack and the Beanstalk. But no, it's not in the Bible. It's an interesting story. There might be some neat little lessons we can learn there, but it's fake. It's not real. I mean, it, it, they're not the truth it is the problem with these fables. So the lesson here with Micah is that, first of all, with church, with church, with worship, with spiritual things, for, look, we must do church God's way. Amen. We must do church God's way. That's why there's so many specific things that are done uh, specifically. Everything's done specifically around here. There's not anything that I can really think of that's done on accident around here. But look, here's the thing. A church that operates in the right way, that it operates God's way, is going to offend people. It's going to offend people. It, it's, look, maybe what you hear every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, maybe what you hear is not what you wanted to hear when you came. But it's surely every single time what you need to hear. Because we're doing church God's way here. We're not doing church your way. We're not doing church my way. We're doing church, you know, God's way. We're going to offend some people. Homosexuals are unnatural people. Amen. That's going to offend people. Yeah, okay. I mean, the fact that they've been given over to this. Oh, I mean, the Bible explains exactly about it. Everyone's so confused. The Bible explains how it happened, what it means, what it means for us. They can't be saved, which means they can't come to church here. That, people aren't going to like that. 
People aren't going to, you know, it, 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 but all the answers are there. All the answers are there. I mean, not just homosexuals, all unnatural things. All unnatural things. They, I'm not even going to name. We know how it happened, the Bible tells us, but that offends people today. People don't want to hear that today. You're not going to grow a church. Well, maybe you will. Maybe you will grow a church that way. I mean, I'm optimistic. But you'll grow a church with the right type of people that want to hear the truth. Okay, we're going to preach the whole thing, even the stuff that offends people. I don't care what the world accepts. I could care less. Like, I could, it's on the negative scale of what the world accepts and what they don't. I could care less. And that's where you need to be. Abortion? We will always preach against that here. Amen. We will always defend every single human life here, Amen. born or unborn. I mean, abortion is murder. Right. You know, I, I don't care if 80% of the country gets to the point where they accept abortion. I could care less. I could care less. We're going to preach the truth here. We're going to preach what the Bible says here. Fornication? We're going to take that so seriously that if you're in fornication, you could literally be, I mean, I hope not, but I mean, you could literally be thrown out of a church for that. That's how serious that we take that sin. I mean, look, not just church, but just the overall point here is this, folks. Your life, your life must be done God's way. And look, you, 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 you listen up. Listen up, because everyone's like, oh yeah, I knew that. No, you don't. Because, I mean, every single person has times in their life. Look, you hear a lot of practical preaching here. Turn to Matthew 12. You hear a lot of practical preaching here. You're going to hear, you're going to see a lot of, you're going to see a lot of, look, because I mean, is, are, are, are all the things that we're seeing in the world today specifically detailed out in the Bible? No, we're, but we're going to hear preaching that applies the Bible to every single detail of the things that you're dealing with in your life. That's practical preaching. Look, but your life, according to all this practical preaching, your life must be done God's way. But Because here's the thing, folks. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 30. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but here's the reason that your life needs to be done God's way. Because God, God is an absolutist. He's into absolutism. He's, he's all one way and none the other way. That's how God operates. And you better understand that. I mean, just look at Matthew 12, 30. The Bible says, he that is with me is against, he that is not with me is against me. I mean, that's extreme. But it gets even worse. It says, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. I mean, that, that basically could be interpreted like, look, if you don't go soul winning, if you're saved and you don't go and get other people saved and gather with Jesus, you're scattering people. I mean, if you are not a soul winner, if you are not out there spending your life opening the Bible and giving the gospel to people to get people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're scattering people. You're like, that is extreme. You're going to stand up here and you're going to tell me that if I don't go soul winning and I don't go out and preach the word of God to people, that I'm literally sending people to hell? Yes. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. Well, look, you get, a, you get a church where 80% of the people don't go soul winning, or you have a bunch of people in the church who just, they don't want to soul win. They don't, I don't want to. Well, if 80% if of your church is like that, and you preach this type of message, those people are either going to get right or they're going to get out. And you're probably going to have a lot smaller church if you keep preaching messages like that. But the people that stay are going to be right. That's why we preach that you should look different. I mean, what, what is it? It's separation. That's why we preach that you need to separate from the world. You're not conformed, but you separate. You should look different. That's the Bible applied to how you dress. You should look different. You should act different. This is why, you know, this is why we preach, we push so hard homeschooling here. Because, I mean, that's the Bible applied to how you raise your children. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I mean, that's the Bible put on all these things. That's why we preach that you should raise your own children. That's the Bible applied to that. Look, that's God's way. And I mean, look, it would not only keep the church right, but it'll keep you right. 
You keep your family right. And I mean, this is the difference. Look, you get outside God's way. You get out. I mean, Micah, he wasn't even in the same, he wasn't even in the same district. But you get outside God's way. I mean, I hope you don't. But if you do, you know, there's going to be consequences to that. So that's why, look, that's why it, it, it's, it's way more important than how many people come here. But it's more important, what's way more important than the numbers here is how we're doing things here. What's, way, what's the most important in your life is, is how, are, are you doing your life? Because here's what people will do, by the way. Here's what people will do. They'll sit here and they're listening. You want to waste your life coming to church here? You want to waste your time here? Here's how you waste your time. And if you do this, I mean, I mean, I'm glad that you come here and have friends and stuff, but you're wasting your time. You're not getting what you could out of this. If you take practical preaching and you listen to it and you're like, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, but, but for me, but for me, you know, I have these extenuating circumstances and things. Um, yeah, so God's way is here, and, but for me, I'm going to go over here. Uh, you know, I'm not going to pay for that. I'm not going to pay for that. That's Judges 17. You see? You want to see? You say, oh, but Micah, he's just some goofy guy. Oh, yeah? Let's wait and see what happens. Let's wait and see the consequences of getting outside God's way. And I'm telling you, there's major consequences. You get outside God's way of doing things, there's major consequences. This silly little story costs countless people their lives. This silly little story. You will lose people. People will die. People will go to hell. You will scatter people abroad. People that you love if you get outside God's way. Like, well, it's scary. I'm trying to scare you. Because I don't want you outside God's way. You go and you leave here and you do what you want. You go, you live your life how you think that you should live your life. I'm trying to teach you what God's way is. I'm trying to spend my life showing you what God's way is and trying to just beg and plead for you to listen to what God's way is. Because I don't want to see anybody suffer consequences. I don't want to suffer consequences. I don't want my kids to suffer consequences. Just, just stick to God's way. Look, here's the thing. It's not complicated. The gospel's simple. God's way, simple. But you got to just shut your own way off. You got to shut your own way off. You gotta shut this wicked world off. Because Satan is out there just like he was doing to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, saying, Really? Does God really want that? Really? For you, I think it's different. No, it's not different for you. It's the same. It's God's way. It's simple, and it's the same for you, and it's the same for your children, and it's the same Bible, and it's always gonna be the same. And that's why, look, this is why. This is not a mega church. Because people want to be conformed to that. And they don't want to hear this type of thing. That's why Micah wanted to do things his own way. And we'll see next week. We'll see the consequences. And you'll see that the consequences weren't necessarily for Micah. But the consequences were for other people. And that's the really sad thing about getting outside of God's way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.